So, hi, thanks for joining us today to talk about wellness in West Coast Swing. I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself so everybody who doesn't recognize you already knows who you are. Cool. What's up, everyone? My name is Brian B. My last name is actually Barakoskis, but I've just gone by Brian B for a number of years. I live in Louisville, Kentucky in the States. Uh, right now, I'm probably the most YouTube famous for putting out a bunch of instructional videos on West Coast, but really, I've been dancing since the late 90s. Um, West Coast swimming, country dancing, line dancing, ballroom dancing. We've had a studio here in Louisville for 15 years. We've run a swing event for seven years. So I have a pretty wide ranging um, history in dance so far. And I think I kind of bridged the gap between the newbies and the grumpy old timers who say that the newbies are ruining West Coast swing. So I sit somewhere in the middle of you guys. Great, thank you. I love that introduction. Um, so thank you so much for talking to us today and we're just having a little bit chat earlier. Hopefully today what we want to get out of it is kind of share a little bit about mindset, about maybe challenging that internal critic and some of the things we all feel. So I'm from the UK, I've been dancing West Coast for about two years now and I'm part of this because I'm also a mindset coach and I really really would love for like healthy mindset to come into everybody's lives in West Coast. Some people have it already and other people have never heard of it so um right yeah um would you mind talking a little bit like you said um earlier about the rising star division that you saw and how doing a routine and competition can really help you develop as a person yeah so we were talking off camera and I said in, in America it was fascinating for me to watch um, like the mental struggles of a lot of West Coast Swing dancers and the Jack and Jills and a lot of people not getting results and crying in their hotel rooms and all that, all that stuff. And it was cool to watch the, uh, the Rising Star Division because they, it, Rising Star is different. There's an amount of work ethic that's different. It's not just show up and do a few songs and before you're Jack and Jill. It's choosing a song that's a very personal choice and finding a coach and working through choreography and then having to perform it once all by yourself in the ballroom to have it go right with your costumes. And it was cool to watch that whole division um, change their mindsets towards one another. It stopped looking competitive and started looking supportive because I think they all appreciated what the other person, or what the other competitors went through. Mm -hmm. um, I distinctly remember one event where they were, as they were walking on and off the floor, they made those pyramids where they put their hands up and everyone had to run down it. And I just thought that was a really cool, uh, just really cool experience. I think it was because, because of the uh, rawness, nakedness of being out there all by yourself and kind of bearing your soul <laughs> as an <laughs> artist, really. So it was interesting. So you found that like the other couples, even though they were technically competing against each other, they ended up kind of supporting each other and cheering each other on because they'd all faced the same level of, of adversity and like you said, vulnerability of going through that process. Yeah, because I think it, if we're comparing it, if we're talking West Coast Swing or comparing Jack and Jill's, what's awesome about it is there's a low barrier to entry. Meaning mm -hmm. if you can, you know, if you can get out of beginner class and do a sugar push, a whip and a side pass, you're qualified to jump into a Jack and Jill. And that's awesome. Um, the only thing about that is as a like lifelong athlete and competitor in dancing, it's not, there's not a lot of work involved, right? It's really just kind of a, Hey, it's a beauty contest. Like, what do I look like after I, you know, just went through a few classes? How am I naturally as a dancer, but the routine divisions are an incredible amount of work. Um, so it's a completely different approach. Mm -hmm. um, so you have yeah, no completely. choice but to put that effort in, whereas Jack and Jill is sort of a choice, isn't it? It's sort of a choice. And it's as a competitive endeavor, it's, there's so few things that you can control, right? Mm -hmm. Like as a routine competitor, you can control your partner, you can control the music, you can control the choreography, you can control the costume, you can control the performance, you can control a lot. Um, as a Jack and Jill competitor, you can't control the music, you can't control the partner, you can't control the rule set, you can't control where you're going to land on the floor. There are so few um, things that you can control that it's not a, it's not the 100 meter dash, right? Whoever crosses the finish line first is clearly the faster runner. It's not the case in a, a Jack and Jill. Yeah. Okay. And so how do you think we can then take that kind of mindset? Cause I love that. And, and I used to do martial arts and 
people never really understood, particularly the women at the higher end of the map, right? There were not many of us. And so we'd go into competition, we'd be all really friendly with each other, we'd ray on, we'd absolutely kill each other, and then we'd ray off and, and be very friendly and supportive again, and we'd be cheering for the other person that we've just fought, even if they've just bested us. And we genuinely meant that. And a lot of yep. people watching us didn't understand how we could absolutely go for it in competition and then genuinely support each other. And it was about the respect for the work and for how well they had done. And if they had beaten us well with a brilliant technique, we were excited by that technique because we've learned from it. Well, yeah. okay, great, now I've got something to learn. But so how do you think you transfer that kind of mindset and attitude from the routine division, which has been born out of necessity, into sort of Jack and Jill, which is the everyday dancer who's maybe maybe part time, maybe taking it fairly seriously as a hobby, but has a day job, um, isn't able to commit those hours or isn't able to find the partner just yet to do the routine. How do we translate that across? Yeah, so I think the first thing that people need to understand, and this has become even more clear through West Coast Swing Online, but boy, at least half, uh, if not close to all of the people competing have some sort of insecurity and it would be shocking for people to know and i'll leave all the the high level names and different dance forms out of it shockingly high level people and champion dancers struggle with the whole am i good enough yeah. um and to some degree and i had a lesson for with a pretty high level student recently and we went through this entire hour long lesson right before the competition. I said, you don't need this lesson. You're ready. Just go do your thing. No, no, no. I need it. And we went through it and through it. And the whole thing boiled down from this technical mistake all the way down to, yeah, but I think that guy's better than me. Okay. And that was really the, 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 the driving issue. And so just understanding that all of us struggle with that from the high level to the low level and that quite possibly we're attracted to the competition as a way to prove to the world that we're good enough. Um, and it sounds hocus pocus, but it's been very surprising to me to see how that happens at the highest level, all the way down to a social dancer in class who might not show up next week because they don't feel like they're as good as everybody else. Um, and then your question was like, well, what do we do with that? And my, my advice to the student recently was that's the feeling that drives all of us, right? So yeah. take it as a healthy thing and go, all right, my, my worth in life does not matter, you know, isn't determined by my Jack and Jill placement, mm -hmm. but that little drive and that little insecurity is going to poke me to practice a little bit. It's going to poke me to show up to class. It's going to motivate me to enter the competition. It's going to motivate me to enter the competition even when I didn't do well and try it again. Um, and that journey then can be very valuable because you're going to learn a lot about yourself. You're going to learn a lot about improving. You're going to learn a lot about success. You're going to learn a lot about failure. And for me as a teacher, that would hopefully teach you a lot of cool lessons in life with, compared to your martial arts, a, a, with low risk, right? The mm -hmm. only thing that can happen is to hurt your feelings. <laughs> No one's going to get injured. Uh, no one's going to get sick over it. The only thing we have to risk is some hurt feelings. Mm, okay. And I, I mean, I completely agree with you, but I have fallen foul of it despite having had lots of help with my mindset. Yeah. And so I've had those moments where I was like, oh my gosh, nobody's going to want to dance with me now because I did really badly. <laughs> and those thoughts come in and it's really hard to challenge them when you're in that place. So if you have kind of slipped accidentally into this, my result in Jack and Jill means I'm not good enough as a dancer. How do we start challenging that to come out of it? Yeah, so I think one of the things that I would love to see happen, and this is helpful when you talked about like I've had help with my mindset. Um, man, a coach or a mentor is in any walk of life, especially in dancing and especially when you're new, is super, super valuable. So someone can say, hey, oh, I know where you're at. I've seen this before. Here's what you're going to feel on your first competition. Here's what you're going to feel the second. Here's what you're going to feel the third. I have a funny story with, with martial arts for you. So I competed in dance for a long, long time. And I started doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And of course, my competitive mindset, I was going to compete. And so I go in after, you know, six months, I tell my instructor, I'm going to compete. I want to plan out my training program. I want to plan out my private lessons. I'm super dedicated and serious. And he looks at me in a Brazilian jiu-jitsu accent and says, 
Barishnikov, you don't even know if you like to fight. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you just go to the tournament and then you see if you like? And I, yes, sir. <laughs> like, but I, was, I, I mean, I was too ignorant. And so, but my ego told me, I'm, and I won as a white belt. And I thought it was really good. And one of the guys came up to me and he goes, man, you're going to be really good in two to three years. I was like, I just won. I'm good. But my, the dance teacher in me knew that I was so new. My victory as a white belt was, I'm not good at all. And then I would have two to three years in doing it before I was even good enough to ask an intelligent question. And then I just had to be okay with that. Even though I was good, I wasn't really good. I was just new. I was good for a new person. I was a little bit natural, but I hadn't learned anything about the uh, martial art yet, really. But my ego <laughs> played on one shoulder, and my experience as a teacher was like, no, dummy, you're just new. Like, don't get a big head. Just keep showing up. Yeah. But yeah, so it, 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 we're all, doesn't matter how much experience we have, we all will go through it, and you just have to be kind of okay with it, and don't let it you know, don't let that get unbalanced, mm -hmm. right? Don't let it run away. And I think having a mentor or someone that you can go back to is super helpful to keep you on track. Yeah. So maybe like, even if your mentor and your coach <coughs> isn't there at the event, because there are times when it happens, maybe you have like a circle of friends or something that you, yep. you know, what, I'm feeling pretty sucky after that and I don't want to. So um, let's talk or let's get this let's go distract or I'm going to go, if there's a pool, I'm going to go swimming for a few minutes and just like really chill and, and settle myself. Yeah. And I think if you create, I mean, if you're going to get serious about it, right. If this is something that's, that kind of speaks to you and you say, Hey, I want to understand more about this coming up with some sort of a recipe and a system, right? Like do you, after the weekend, call your trusted friend, it doesn't even have to be a dancer, call mm -hmm. your friend, call your coach, call your, uh, call your mom, whoever is, you know, supportive and understands a little bit about you and like download all the information. And if you can be honest about it, and this is the hard part, going back to my student who is fussing over this turn and I always miss this hand, but really he was freaking out mentally during the process. And he was freaking out mentally because of an insecurity. As soon as he identified that, amazingly better performance and amazingly better experience. And I told him, I said, I don't even care if you get the result your your performance is better your mindset's better you're less stressed you're enjoying it more people notice that like so many things improve and eventually it will show up on the judges scorecards mm. as goofy as that sounds it will but i i love that i love that you've mentioned that it's, it's about the experience because one of the really big shocking things for me coming in was seeing people compete and I know we invest a lot of money in it and you know like I'm at a point in my life where I can't invest as, in as many weekends as I would like just, just financially it's not possible right now so then if you're going to a competition you're like oh this is the only one I can I can afford for the six months um it becomes like a lot of pressure on you but if mm -hmm. you're enjoying that journey you're not enjoying the experience then it's kind of almost pointless it's like even if you got the result even if you win like is it worth it if you don't enjoy it um, some people will say yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it's funny, like over my shoulder from all sorts of dance stuff, I have a bunch of trophies. And one time my, my nephew said, but, but uncle Brian, you're, you won this and you have that. And I looked at, I looked at him and I said, yeah, you can buy that trophy for $39 online and put whatever you want on it. <laughs> yeah. Like the trophy is not that cool, but the stories and the experience and the lessons that you gain and the friendships you make, that, that's pretty cool. Mm. Like I look at the, I look at West Coast Swing dancers like you and I, and I watch them run around to all the events and I look at my friend and I go, I wonder which one of them is making a lifelong friend that they don't know yet. Yeah. They're meeting a lot of people and somewhere out of that, they're going to meet a lifelong friend through that experience. Like yeah. those are the things that are much more valuable. I've definitely met a few of those already, um, sadly in different countries, so we can talk on Skype, but um, yeah, it's been amazing, and when you were then visiting their country, like, oh my gosh, come see me, which I, I love about the community, it's like, it's not just Super about cool. dancing. My best friend lives in Portugal now, one of my best friends, <laughs> like, <laughs> he used to live in America, but you know, dancing and life took him to England and off to Portugal, and yep, yeah. so thankfully Facebook, uh, you know, Messenger helps keep, keep us connected. <laughs>
yeah you just have to navigate the time zones in brilliant so what would your advice be to let's start with the absolute beginner who's coming in and is a bit overwhelmed by this magical world of west coast <coughs> there's so much possibility um but also like this big focus on kind of technique if they've not been used to it before what would your advice be there to get in the right mindset yeah. So again, if you can find some sort of a mentor coach, it could be your local coach. Um, and I'm going to talk about that for two seconds. Number one, there's a culture of people to take lessons from a million different coaches because I need better opinions. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Find someone that you trust and trust is a good thing because then they can guide you. And if there are other coaches for you to take from, um, let that person be your guide and it will calm down the crazy information of this technique, that technique. Um, that's number one. Number two, I would like my martial arts story. Like my, my coach said, you don't even know if you like it. Don't stress over it. Your first competition is just simply information. See what it's like, right? Mm -hmm. Go through the experience, go through the nervousness, go through the, how does this work when they put us on the floor and how do I put my number on and why am I wearing a number? And, who, who's going to put it on for me? That's why you need a friend because you can't stick it on. And yeah, what do I wear? And follows where you need a very, very good trust with the person pinning your number on your behind. Right, right. <laughs> so don't stress over the first one. Then competitively, if you're going to continue, my minimum is you don't get to complain about the result for three competitions. Okay. And I'll tell you why. If you do one competition, let's just say that you are really good but you get marked poorly. Well, that's not representative, right? Maybe you got a bad partner. Maybe the song choice wasn't good. Maybe you got stuck in a different part of the floor. One of those factors worked against you. You actually are good, but you got marked down. Over the next competition, next to competition, maybe you get a better song choice. Maybe your partner's a little different. Maybe your placement on the floor is different. And through those three competitions, you'll start to see a more average of your results, right? And so maybe the competitions are one, two, three, and you're improving. Maybe the first one is really good and you win and you think you're the rock star, but that was the anomaly. You're not as good as you thought, right? Brian B wins as a white belt, but he's actually not as good as he thought. Um, so don't stress over the first one. Well, you will stress, but in, like learn through the process. And then if you're going to do this as a, as a hobby and you're going to continue, don't stress over the result after three competitions, you can then look at those like data points and kind of see, are things getting better? Are they getting worse? Am I, am I in the middle of the pack? Am I one of the not as good people? Am I one of the better people? And then from that point, you can start to go back to your coach, make some adjustments if you want to continue to improve your results. And again, three more competitions and then plot the improvements from there. And that would, if I could give people advice, that would be it three competitions before you complain about your results, have a coach that can guide you through the process and then um, listen to them, listen to them. Okay, great. And so look, we have quite a lot of um, smaller communities. There are some that are like London focused, Bristol focused, Manchester, so big city focused. But mm -hmm. like for me, I am in a smaller community. It's about an hour from anything else. Um, and we have a mixture of abilities, but they're probably like, we're a lot more novice than you might see at a lot of weekenders. So what would your advice be to somebody who's never even maybe gone to competition and is just entering in for fun and social dancing. And then there's this whole world of really like, Oh, we compete and we do these things. They're like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then I hear from my fellow classmates. Oh, I don't want to go to events because I don't want to compete. They're not for me. I'm not good enough to go to them. Like what would your advice be to them? Yeah. So again, you don't know until you try it. Right. Yeah. Um, so I would give it a shot. It, it does most events, depending upon the style, like there's plenty of social dancing and different events have different cultures. Like we run one here that has competition, but it's very beginner friendly, very social. Then there are big events like Mad Jam that's going on somewhere this weekend and within a couple of weeks here, there's 1500 people. It's all the high level competitors, but both all events have both, right? Yeah. So you don't have to just compete if you're going. You can go support your friends. You can go social dance. You can go take workshops. You can also compete. Um, so give it a shot. Expect to be overwhelmed. <laughs> Expect to be over. There's no way you can, you're going to walk into a room full of people that look amazing to you. They might be the best West Coast swing dancers on the planet. 
they might all be at their second event, only one event more than you, you're going to think that they all know what they're doing and you're the newbie. Everyone goes to that feeling. Everyone. First time. So yeah. it's going to be overwhelming and that's okay. And it's not, it, you're not a weirdo. Everyone went through that the first time. Super yeah. overwhelming to see a floor full of hundreds of dancers that are all better than you've ever seen. Um, so yeah, expect that. That's normal. No, no big deal. You're not the weirdo. You're not the worst person to dance West Coast Swing. Like, there's a good chance that 50% of those people are just as petrified as you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it, everyone, everyone, high level competitors, brand new people. We all go through it. Totally normal. You're not, what's my mother say? You're, um, I can't remember. You're just another bimbo on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> She's a kind mom. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, it's, you're, 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 you're insecure feelings or you're not unique we all have them <laughs> i love that and yeah i think so for me I'm, I'm a bit weird my first event i could get to as a solo follow was actually a european event and i didn't know anybody there and it's in the netherlands i don't speak the language or anything <laughs> core event director i didn't really realize there weren't taxis so they had to end up picking me up and oh, no. but yeah i went in and i was like <gasps> there's so much here but also oh my gosh there's so much i can learn um, yeah. And I, I found that really exciting. And I think when I can do events, I notice my learning and my growth just accelerates so much. Yep. Um, and the awesome thing about social dance events, right? West Coast Swing is ultimately a social dance. It is a very natural way to meet people, right? Mm -hmm. Like the ballroom community, especially in America, gets a, uh, a stuffy people. Are, ballroom dancers are stuffy. And I've spent quite a long time in that, of the, in, in that world as well. And they're no more stuffy. It's just the nature of ballroom events typically don't have social dancing or very many workshops. So I would have to go to so many events, compete against people. We'd show up in the ballroom, we'd do our competition, go through the rounds, do awards, and then we'd leave. And it took so many events of like casually walking past these people before I'd finally nod, before I'd finally say hi, before I'd finally stop and have a conversation. It might be a year before I stopped and had a conversation with someone that I saw. Mm, In a wow. West Coast Swing event, you do your Jack and Jill, you do your whatever the thing is, and then the music comes on and we're social dancing. And you're gonna have a conversation an hour later with that person. And you're gonna end the weekend knowing a handful of people. You ended that weekend in the Netherlands knowing people, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, no, it was really yeah. good for getting to know people. Um, I was really yeah. well. They were so welcoming, so that was really great. <laughs> it, and it's built in, right? You're gonna see. Okay, you're shy. Just sit by the dance floor. Someone will ask you to dance. Like, <laughs> ask someone to dance. Boom, you're gonna have a friend. It's 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 really cool for that. Really, really cool. Yeah, and, and I there think are goofy one of people. My, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. And that was one of my challenges was asking people to dance because like, oh my gosh, she's going to want to dance with me. Like I have no clue what I'm doing and they're amazing. But they were, when I was brave enough and it yep. did take maybe shamefully a few gins to be brave enough, <laughs> I did employ yep. such courage. I'd like to say I was just like put on my black belt and went, but no, I didn't. Um, but once I asked people, they, was, they were smiling and engaging and so they enjoyed it, you know, even people who are way better than me. So um, yeah, yep. it does take courage, definitely. And it's totally acceptable. Hi, my name is Natalie. This is my first event. Uh, I'm kind of new. That's great information, right? So now someone knows to take, a, a, a nice person will know to take it easy on you and make it an enjoyable experience. And you'll run into a dingaling or two. They're, they're in every community. It's not you. It's not that they dislike you. There's dingalings in my group class here at the studio. There's dingalings in your city. There's a few dingalings out there. <laughs> I don't know if that's an English term. Weirdos, uh, mean people. There's a few out there. Like they're in every walk of life. You're gonna run into those people. Do not let them ruin your day. Go back to the friendly people. There's there's nine friendly people for every goofy person. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's good to remember. It's not really you. If they're upset with you, it's probably nope. a little bit about them as well. Nope. Can't get rid of them. I've tried. Can't get rid of them. <laughs> we can maybe help them improve. I would like to think that we can help them improve and change their ways. <laughs> Natalie, if you can figure it out, <laughs> let us know, please. I'm working on that. Apparently headlocks are not allowed, so I've got other strategies I'm working on now. <laughs> that's the, right? That's the, the martial arts analogy. I go, I had 
so many cool people in martial arts because if someone came in there with a weird ego oh it sorts just, you out really quickly they would get beat up for the week and they would either quit or they'd be really cool yeah yeah it's um it's a interesting way to learn um but it's, it's transformative or <laughs> destructive um so we're trying to find softer ways to do that um you, you mean you can't headlock newcomer students who are arrogant no no oh no okay. <laughs> it's against the law yeah <laughs> Um, we would just try and lead by example. And this is like maybe the, because I know we're, sh we're sort of getting short on time, but one of the things that for me, I would love to see more of, and I, when I go out to international communities, I'm starting to see it. And I think it's maybe also me being in the right headspace to recognize it. But something mm -hmm. I used to love in, in martial arts, I'd like to perhaps experience more in West Coast, and I don't know if it's just my personal experience, is that kind of social responsibility of if you are the the better dancer for lack of a better term, better term yeah. um, when, some, when you're dancing with somebody socially, I see that as your responsibility to make it enjoyable for both of you. Um, rather than make the other person feel uncomfortable that maybe their skill level isn't at yours at the moment. Um, and so we used to train in this way with higher grades, we're always eager to help lower grades because yeah. If you help the lower grade, they're going to improve faster, which means you get more people to play with, right? You yep. get more people yep. to like learn and grow with. So I'd love to see that. So how do you think in an art where it's very much about self-improvement, self-growth, how do we then start asking our more skilled, more experienced dancers to help create that sense of community whereby they are fostering the growth of those who are earlier in their journey? Yeah, I think it becomes a culture, right? Like, if that's the culture in your space, it will continue and perpetuate itself. And sometimes I think what happens in every community I've been to, every kind of community, West Coast swing and ballroom and line dancing and country dancing, might have started back in the day with someone with a boom box and, you know, a hall or a basement and three people showing up. Um, but once that, so the person starting it might not have a ton of experience, but anyone who's watching this, who's in that room with six people in a boom box or today a laptop, you know, and an external speaker. Um, if you can start to create that culture of when the new, obviously I have a dance studio, right? So it's good for me business wise to be friendly to the new people, but then the new person, because we were friendly to them, they just naturally are friendly to the other new people. And yeah. then I don't even have to manage the situation. It's the culture has been set, right? Um, so I think any one of us can start that process. And then once you're friendly to that person, that person will likely be friendly to the next person. And then the culture in your class, in your room, in your community will be set. Um, and cultures will be different place to place, right? There's different personalities and there's different... Um, you know, different countries have different personalities, but I think if you can set that culture, it will perpetuate itself quite a bit. Mm. So start with you, basically. That's the, if you can figure out a better way, <laughs> I can't figure out a better way. <laughs> no, I was just kind of trying to summarize because I think there's yeah. so much wisdom coming out. So yes, yeah, so start with you and then um, allow it to spread. <laughs> yeah, and there's sometimes a, there's sometimes a need and I sometimes dislike the word the community. Well, the community should do this. And that's kind of making it external, right? Mm -hmm. Like someone else should do it for you. People who do this at events. Well, the, the event needs to do this. I'm like, well, you could do it. The event should have a party for the rising star competitors. Why don't you just throw a party? Or go a party. Do in your hotel room, right? Like to take some responsibility ourselves instead of wanting the teacher to do it and the event to do it and the community to do it. Like you said, it's we're all individuals and we all have the power to make that. And if enough individuals make those choices, then the community is doing it and the event is doing it and the class is that way. Mm, I like that. Yeah, it's definitely the, <clears throat> the corporate social responsibility or the group social responsibility starts with you and then it's outwards. So, yeah. 100%. And I think sometimes there's a little bit of a culture that we want someone else to do it for us. <laughs> Boy, it's easier, I, right? <laughs> it sure be easier, but it doesn't work that way very well. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. 
So thank you very much. I think like the last thing I'd really like to ask you because our time's running by is if you could get everybody in a West Coast community, new, very experienced, champion, complete and utter novice, um, to hear one thing to help them enjoy their dancing more, what would it be? Oh, that's a big question. That's a big question, Natalie. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> You know, I don't think that there's, I don't think that there's a single answer. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know who Skippy Blair is? I have read about Skippy, but I have not ever met. So I asked her a similar question. I said, Skippy, I got to spend two weekends with her at her house. And um, she, she's 95 maybe today, or will be 95 in March. Incredible lady. Um, and so if you guys don't know who she is, you can look up, just Google Skippy Blair. We did a a whole series on her and a couple little videos. And I asked her if you could put a sign, because she's been dancing her whole life, like 90 years. If you could put a sign above every dance hall in the world, what would it be? And she said, if you could walk, you can dance. And then in the typical Skippy Blair kind of fun humor, she goes, but Brian, a lot of people don't know how to walk very well. <laughs> <laughs> so if you kind of unpack that, you go, everyone can do it. Right, and she's got an incredible like story about moving to music that is on the is on our blog, but to understand that no, it, it's not going to be easy. It's a process. It's a new skill. It's I'm amazed that any of us can figure it out. Right, like from a martial arts background. Okay, you have to uh, learn a technique, but then you have to apply it to another moving body, and then in dancing you have to apply your technique, your move, your movement, your connection, your patterns and you have to apply it with another human, and then you have to match it to the music. Yeah. And then you have to create this magic moment that makes it cool for in a competition. It is an incredibly complex thing, and I'm amazed that any of us can do it, and yet any, anyone can do it. You might not be the champion, because it'll be only, only one winner. Um, so to be okay with that process, and I think it's easier if you have gone through a process in something else in life. Like, I had a pilot one day said, Brian, learning to dance is just like flying a plane. <laughs> it, it's not. I've been in a 767 simulator. It's not. But to him, it was like, oh, there's a process. You're going to get in this cockpit and nothing's going to make sense. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through all of these trainings and all these stages and levels and different airplanes and check out at different levels. And that's the same for dancing. And so to him, it was the same. But if you've never gone through that process and you don't understand how overwhelming it can be, it looks like you could never do it. But but you can't. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Yeah, I guess um, what, what I'm getting from that is um, don't limit yourself because everybody can give it a go and it's up to you what you get out of it. So even if you yep. don't walk well, you can improve your walking if you try. A hundred percent. And it takes an incredible amount of time. I look at really young, talented dancers, like really talented people. And I go, man, you could be a champion one day and it might take them a decade. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and even if they don't get, so I had a, I went back into country Western dancing. There was this division I wanted to win. And so my partner and I, we, we worked for two and a half years and I got to second place. We had to win five of our eight dances to be the champions. We won three of the eight, right? So I got close. Obviously that was like a lifelong goal. I wanted that trophy. I have had way more value out of going through the process than I would have gotten if I just walked in one, got the trophy, went home. Yeah. Like if I walked in year one, got the trophy, went home, I would have never gone through the struggles and learned. I would have never um, known what it's like to give everything and come up short and struggle with, does that mean I'm not good enough? No, I'm really good. I'm, I just didn't win the competition. It's just a, a game of a competition. It had nothing to do with my self-worth or my abilities. Um, well, who and you are as a human, I guess. Like, I think we attach that, am I worth loving and spending time with to my ability and skill in something? And it's like, well, our worthiness of love is on our, who we've worked to become and our behaviors rather than our skill in a particular task. A hundred percent. And if, you know, and I've been on both sides of it, right? Like I've been super obsessed to the exclusion of friends and family and I have tried to be more inclusive and still be a hard working in my dancing and the latter is way better mm. the latter is way better right you'll see you'll see fighters you know they 
they have to go in a training camp and for 12 weeks, you know, it's tunnel vision. But then afterwards, they spend time with their family, they relax, they enjoy life, they, they work on their business pursuits, they work on their family life, and then they go back in a training camp, right? Um, and to have everything makes it, it's not that the competition doesn't matter, we're going to strive for it, it matters. But it, it should not be your self-worth, it should not determine whether you're a good person, or whether you're worth loving, or any of that stuff. Yeah. And it's hard to, you know, because that little insecurity is what drives us sometimes to do it and let it drive you, but just keep it in perspective. And it sounds woo woo, but man, it, it's so true. Well, it's not woo woo. There's lots of, um, there's lots of data so <laughs> on it that we could share. But I mean, so I come from a, also come from a scientific background in pharma and like you only need to look at the effects of placebo in a clinical trial to know that how you believe in something has scientific outcomes. It's amazing. It is, uh, yeah. And my, my experience taught me that early as a teacher. And then as I got into some literature and stuff like that, or an experience where I had a coach that you know, had been dancing like 60 years, right? He was in like the 1968 World Latin Finals. And he gave me this drill. And then years later, I read a book. And the concept of the drill that he'd been using for 50 years was like right out of the scientific literature of the best way to learn a skill. This guy didn't read the literature. He figured it out. Yeah. So yeah, it, 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 our experience, you know, even when you research it, 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 our experience will prove out the research and the research will prove out the experience. Brilliant. Thank you. And so do you have anything you'd like to kind of like leave us with or leave on? Because that's so much wisdom just in a very short space of time. I don't know if there needs to be anything else, but. Yeah, I, I just think one of the, there's so many things to take into account with this whole journey. And I really think that for me and my pursuits, and then I look at students and I look at people around me and if you can find some sort of a mentor or a coach, Mm -hmm. and develop a relationship and invest in that relationship um, that will be very valuable so if you're new and you want to enter in a competition or you've done it a couple of times try to find someone that you can relate to and develop a relationship with them right and that can be your barometer to your journey because who knows what things you might encounter right who knows I've, mm -hmm. I've what insecurity is, where we come from, what your unique thing is. There's no way we could cover it all here. But by developing a relationship and someone, a coach if possible, um, to help you along the journey. Anyone can tell you the technique, that's easy. But to help you along that journey and keep you on the path um, so that you can improve and go for your goals, if that's important, so you can enjoy the process and have fun because that is important. Um, and then as you learn those things, you can turn around and give them away to other people. And to your point, that starts to build a culture and a community. Yeah. So if it, one piece of advice, find a mentor or someone that you, can, um, that you can glean some wisdom from that can know you personally, and that will help calm down the craziness of everything going on around us. <laughs> yeah have have that one person to help you ground thank you so much that's been brilliant and i i like that little bit you had in there like you need to be able to have fun and enjoy it too um i think we sometimes forget that it is supposed to be fun even when it's hard work <laughs> it is. yeah and the striving matters right like the, if you're going to enter the competition and you're going to compete and you're going to put time and effort and money into it yeah of course the result matters but it doesn't mean that you're the world's best person if you win and it doesn't mean that you're a terrible person if you lose it just means that your result in the competition either was good or wasn't good it does not directly relate to you as a human mm -hmm. um, but sometimes that little insecurity is what drives us and if you can identify it awesome awesome like go i got it and then what do you do with it let it motivate you mm -hmm. let it motivate you to you know, get the goal, let it motivate you to teach it to other people. Um, but look for it and find it. And then once you know what it really is, now you're, you know, now you're living with your eyes open and, uh, and you can use it for good. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there's so much we can cover in more detail, but I'm going to um, call us off there. Thank you so much for your time. And we really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us. You bet. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. Super fun. Okay.